I am Dr. Paul Levine. I am an assistant professor at the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston School of Dentistry. Besides my clinical duties, I am course director of the pre-doctoral students in dental sleep medicine. Today, I am going to demonstrate how I would screen a patient for sleep disordered breathing and then I will include additional features on the exam that would be necessary if I were going to continue with oral appliance therapy. This further exam will help to exclude those patients that might not be a candidate for oral appliance therapy. This video was developed in conjunction with my colleagues Dr. Gerald Simmons who is a neurologist and sleep disorder specialist and Dr. Ronald Prane who limits his practice to facial pain and sleep disorders dentistry. Due to the fact that millions of Americans suffer from some kind of sleep disordered breathing, I feel that it is an incumbent on all us dentists in the dental community to screen our patients for nighttime sleep breathing disorders. I like to start out my exam with the craniomandibular anatomy. What I'm looking for is, I'm looking for, is there a retruded chin or not? How long the face is in a superior inferior direction? And is the maxilla itself short in this direction? All these things could indicate a shorter airway. I also look at the cricomental space. That is the distance from around the cricoid cartilage to the symphysis. I also look at the mandibular length from here to here, the angle of the mandible to the symphysis. Both of these, if they're short, could indicate a smaller airway. Okay, after I've done that, then I'm going to start my intraoral exam. So would you please open for me? I start the intraoral exam at the mandible. First thing I want to look at is the mandibular arch width. How wide is it? Is it normal, is it narrow, or is it wide? After I look at that, I'm going to look at the tongue. I want to know if the tongue is normal, large, or very large compared to the mandibular arch width. It's all relative to that. So a patient could have what looks like a large tongue, but if they have a wide arch, that should not be a problem. So I look at that and I want to see, and what I'm seeing here is that her tongue is above the occlusal plane. What we would like is the dorsal surface of the tongue to rest in the floor of the mouth, basically at the level of the occlusal plane. The higher this tongue is above the occlusal plane, the more chance there is for the airway being closed off at night. So when I look in her mouth, her tongue is above the occlusal plane, and she has a small arch. The other key for this is she has a scallop tongue. There are scallops on the lateral surface of the tongue. This indicates either that the tongue is too big for the lower arch, or it can indicate clenching or bruxing. Next thing I'm going to look just to see if there are any the presence of tori on the mandible. And here there, there are no tori. Uh, tori could mean that the patient is clenching or bruxing. All right, so now that I'm through with the mandible, I'm going to go up, I'm going to proceed to the back of the throat, and I'm going to look at the soft palate. Now what I'm looking for in the soft palate is, how far does the soft palate go down posteriorly into the pharynx? So in order to see that, I will get a tongue depressor. I will have the patient say, ah, and I'm looking to see, can I see the end of the soft palate? Where is it? How far is it down the pharynx? The longer the soft palate is down the pharynx, the more chance there is for obstructive breathing at night. I also want to look at the uvula. Is the uvula elongated? Is it short? Is it thick? Is it edematous? An elongated uvula could lead to obstructing breathing at night. So I definitely want to be able to evaluate that and, and look at it. Then I will look at the hard palate. The information I can get from that is, is the hard palate vaulted or is it wide? Is it normal? 
the narrower the uh, maxillary arch, probably the higher vault the patient's going to have. That means that there is a lack of airway space, or there could be a smaller airway. So I just simply look at the vault. If it's a high vault, that, that's another risk factor for sleep disordered breathing. Also look in the roof of the mouth to see if there's a torus palatinus. She has one, but it's very, very small. All right, then I'm going to look at the tonsils. Say, ah, uh, uh, okay. All right, so next I'm going to do the Malampati score. I actually do what's called the modified Malampati score. The original Malampati score was to have the patient stick their t open their mouth wide and stick their tongue out. When you stick your tongue out, you put tension on the tongue and you put tension on the soft palate that raises a soft palate in a superior direction, which would give me a false sense of what's going on when she's sleeping at night. Because when they're sleeping at night, everything is completely relaxed. So I tell the patient to completely relax their tongue and open their mouth, open their mouth wide. That's what I call the modified Mal and Patty score. So just relax your tongue and open wide. What I'm looking for is to see if I can actually see the airway. The Mal and Patty score is graded one, two, three, and four. One being when the patient opens wide, go ahead and open wide, you could see a wide open airway. That's a low risk factor for sleep disordered breathing. One, two, three, four. Four is the highest risk. You see nothing. You see no airway. You don't even see the end of the soft palate when the patient opens wide. That's a high risk for sleep disordered breathing. And then there's two and three in between. Look at, next I look at the dentition. The first thing I'd like to know is signs of clenching or bruxing. So I'm going to look for any fractured teeth, wear facets, abfractions, or even gingival clefting. All these would indicate clinching or bruxism. Next, my colleague, Dr. Gerald Simmons, will explain the chin press tongue curl maneuver. I'm Dr. Gerald Simmons, and I'm going to demonstrate to you the chin press and the chin press tongue curl maneuver. We've come to find that this is one of the more predictive parts of the physical exam to identify those patients that may actually have obstructive breathing during sleep. All the other components are important, but this sort of tries to simulate what occurs during the sleeping process. So this is a way of going through the part of the examination. We start off with our baseline, and you have the patient lying supine, maintaining a gentle bite. So the instructions I give the patient are like this. I want you to bite down and I want you to breathe in and breathe out through your nose. Breathe in and breathe out. Okay, do that again. Breathe in and breathe out. This is the baseline condition that we're going to compare when we go do the chin press and the chin press tongue curl. But at this part of the examination, in some patients, we actually can observe alar collapse. And that's when the ala of the nose pulls inward from the negative pressure that's created from the flow of air through the nose. And we don't see it in this particular scenario, but that can occur and is a sign of nasal obstruction. Okay. So now, I want you to relax your jaw, I want you to relax your tongue, and I want you to relax the muscles in the back of your throat. I'm going to gently push down on your chin, and I want you again to breathe in and out through your nose. While you're doing that, you may feel a blockage develop in the back of your throat. If you feel that, I do not want you to try to prevent that. I do not want you to thrust your jaw or your tongue forward because we're trying to see if your airway is going to be blocking as your jaw falls back and your throat is relaxed, okay? So just open your mouth just a little bit, relax your jaw, relax your tongue, and breathe through your nose. You actually blocked at that point of expiration. So it's both an inspiratory and expiratory. Now, if someone blocks during this, um, if there's a partial blockage, we call that a one plus on the, when we grade this. She actually had a two plus because she came to a point where she had a complete blockage. We'll do this one more time. Just relax your jaw, relax your tongue, and breathe through your nose. Okay, so you can see that her blockage occurred right at the very beginning of the um, expiratory process at the very end of inspiration, end of expiration. Okay, so that's the chin press. And again, that can be scored at zero, one, 
or two. One would be partial blockage. So you'd hear, maybe hear snoring, or you hear some, uh, you know, you could hear that there's some obstruction. Or sometimes you can't even hear it, but the patient describes that they had uh, noticed it was harder for them to breathe. Okay, so now again, comparing it to when you bite down, there's no blockage. Okay, so now we're going to do the chin press tongue curl. I want you to relax your jaw. Now I want you to put the tip of your tongue on the roof of your mouth and move the tongue to the back of the roof of your mouth, okay? Now I want you to breathe in and out through your nose. Okay, so here, now she's actually having obstruct, complete obstruction on inspiration too. So this is a real profound uh, degree. So there's a two plus on the chin press and a two plus on the chin press tongue curl. Now bite down and breathe through your nose normal. This is a great example how mandibular position can change the airway. Now obviously, you know, um, the, our patient here does not have obesity. She doesn't have a thick neck. She doesn't have some of the features that people um, uh, think sleep apnea is always associated with. This is a patient that is has mandibular anatomy and soft tissue intraoral anatomy that predisposes her to obstruction. And when her jaws relax, when she's asleep, her airway blocks. And you could see that bruxing or clenching or keeping the mouth closed drastically improves the airway. Thank you. It's important to measure neck circumference. To do that, place the tape gently around the patient's neck just below the thyroid cartilage. Once you feel comfortable with this exam, you can incorporate it as part of your examination on every patient that you see. After the patient has had a sleep test and been diagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea, there needs to be a more thorough exam prior to taking impressions and constructing a mandibular advancement device. I'm going to demonstrate further this examination process. One part of this is what I call retention of the teeth. Many of these devices need to be very retentive as they slide over the teeth. So I examine the teeth as if I would for a patient that I'm making a removable partial for to look for undercuts. I'm looking at the buccal and lingual surfaces of the teeth for their contour. Are they bell-shaped with a natural undercut? Are they pretty much straight up and down with very little undercut? That will help determine which appliance I might choose for this patient. If there's a lot of undercuts, I might choose an appliance that has a thermoplastic lining. If there are really no undercuts, then I would have to choose an, a, an appliance that is mainly made of acrylic with ball clasps. So this is very much part of the examination prior to constructing a dental appliance. I will continue on with a muscle evaluation. I have a checklist that I use. I simply go through the palpations of the muscles and the TM joint and check it off and take notes. I start off with the superficial masseter. Okay. I'm going to do the deep masseter. Would you please open the side and the left side. Next I'll proceed to the temporalis. Is there any soreness? Should have had, okay, Sorry. take your glasses off. Yeah. Next I'm going to proceed to the temporalis tendon. Is there any soreness there? Mm -hmm. Okay, the right side, that's sore. The left side, is there any soreness? Yeah. Both of them? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the temporalis tendon right and left are both sore, so I record that. Then I want to palpate the medial pterygoid. Okay. I find the medial pterygoid by going right up the mandibular rafe and palpating just behind the second Mo upper second molar. Is that sore? Mm -hmm. Okay. Same thing over here. Okay, right, th right there. Is that sore? Mm -hmm. Alright, so she's sore on both sides of her medial pterygoids. You really cannot palpate the lateral pterygoid muscle, so what I will do is what I call the stabilization test. I'm going to hold your jaw, open just a little bit, I'm going to hold your jaw steady 
and I want you to try to protrude your jaw while I try to hold it steady. Go ahead and protrude. Does that hurt anywhere? Right or left? No. All right, now I'm going to stabilize your lower jaw, and I want you to try to move left and right. Go ahead. Does that hurt anywhere? Mm -hmm. Where does it hurt? All right, so that tells me that her right lateral <coughs> pterygoid is inflamed. Last, as far as muscles, I'm going to check the digastric. Is there any soreness in your muscles here? No. Oh, okay, so the digastrics are okay. All right, it's very important that we see their range of motion. If a patient doesn't have a proper range of motion, I'm probably not going to be able to make them an oral appliance. So the first thing I want to have the patient do is open, open as wide as you can, okay? Now, normally I would have, okay, relax. Normally I would have a millimeter ruler and I would actually measure that. Open wide, I would measure from incisal tip to incisal tip. And it should be 40 millimeters or more to feel comfortable making an oral appliance. All right, I want you to open a little bit. Now, close just a little bit. Okay, move your jaw laterally as far as you can to the right and as far as you can to the left. All right, I would like, our, I would like my patient to be able to move seven millimeters or more to the right or to the left. That's just for range of motion. We want a good range of motion. And show me how far you can push your jaw out. Okay, go back to normal. Now out, go out as far as you can. Push your jaw out. All right, from the centric position all the way out, we'd like our patient to be able to protrude at least six millimeters. If they can't, that suggests that we may not have success with oral appliance therapy because the whole idea behind oral appliance therapy is to be able to protrude the mandible which brings the tongue out, which opens the airway. So if they can't protrude very much, our therapy is going to be less effective. I want to know if the patient's lower jaw, the mandible, deviates on opening and closing and on protrusive. So I get behind the patient, open a little bit. All right, let me watch. All right, close all the way. Now open, all the way, close, open, close. Open, close. I also want to know if she has any deviation on protrusion. So open just a little bit. Now push your jaw out as far as you can. Go back in. Push in as far as you can. Go back in. One more time. Push it out as far as you can. Okay, go back in. Try to push straight out. Straight out. Go straight out with your jaw. All right, there's a little bit of deviation there. At one point she went to the right, to the left. At one point she went to the right. You need to practice with your patients trying to go straight out before you take your bite records to make an appliance. All right, I'm going to examine the TM joint. Open wide. Close. All right, is, open wide. Close. Do you have any pain upon opening and closing? Slightly. All right, just just stay closed. Is there any pain? No. All right, open. Is there pain now? I, yeah. Once, which side? Both sides. Okay, both both sides. All right. After I have performed the TMJ exam, I will need to determine if I can proceed with oral appliance therapy. The following are the general guidelines that I use. If there is no popping or clicking or if there is clicking without any pain or locking of the joint, then I feel free to proceed with oral appliance therapy. If there is transient mild TMJ pain upon palpation, maybe some clicking, but no locking, then I still feel comfortable to proceed with oral appliance therapy and maybe adding some joint exercises. However, if there is a history of TMJ pain or locking, or pain with palpation, then the course of treatment should be to treat the TM joint first, consider putting the patient on CPAP, and then oral appliance therapy can be reconsidered at a future time. The information presented in this video is for educational purposes. It is not intended for the specific treatment of any specific patients. Using the concepts expressed in the video, 
should be done in the context of the patient's specific clinical situation and proper clinical judgment is required by the dentist. This video is the property of the Sleep Education Consortium and cannot be used without proper consent. The Sleep Education Consortium is a nonprofit organization with the mission of enhancing the knowledge of sleep medicine to the public and health care industry.